this kind of data, you know, people are gathering this on paper, and then like they take the paper and they transcribe it into Excel, and then someone has to make a graph, and they print it out, and they put it on the board. You know, one of our advisors calls this the uh, the "you suck yesterday" board, right? <laughs> Manufacturing is sexy. Sounds crazy? Just wait. I'm Z Holly, host of The Art of Manufacturing, your behind the scenes look at how people who make stuff are trying to make it in their industries. If you've ever wondered how to build a brand, a business, or just a better mousetrap, tune in and enjoy. Manufacturing technologies have been changing fast. As we've heard on previous episodes, we can order custom on-demand products from Weave or Shoes of Prey. We can give robots the dirty work, as described by Rod Brooks at Rethink Robotics. Jesse Janae's company Lumi lets marketing departments source brand new packaging with a push of a button. And Nick Pinkston of Plethora explained how designers with minimal engineering expertise can design a part, get immediate and automated feedback and pricing, and get it delivered within three days. But in reality, it's not so easy. Legacy factories take longer to catch up with technology. And that's where this week's guests come in. Ronnie Kabat and Eric Mirandet are from Tulip Interfaces, a company spun out of the MIT Media Lab. Through their work with lab sponsors, they realized how hard it was to digitize a factory. And so they set out to change that with IoT, also known as the Internet of Things. A company can get started with no programming experience and as little as $3,500. I was a little skeptical at whether some techies can just waltz in and transform a factory. So I was eager to see how it works and hear about what they learned along the way. They also tell stories about riding motorcycles across Africa, counterintelligence missions, and being on reality TV. We hear about that and a whole lot more on this week's episode of The Art of Manufacturing. You walk into a factory floor and most of what you see is like people, machines, and paper. It's amazing how many people are involved in making the everyday things that we use and like how many hands are touching every single thing that we work with. And the paper is there because there's, you know, it's in a, in a lot of ways still, it's an industry which is, which is untouched by, by computers. In a sentence... How would you describe what Tulip does? Tulip is a, a new kind of software for the manufacturing floor. It's a way for a manufacturing engineer to, to build applications themselves without writing any software, and then take those applications, deploy them onto the shop floor for operators and associates to, to use to improve their quality, to collect data about what's actually happening on the floor. And I think fundamentally what we do is we give speed to manufacturing. We are a way to iterate faster on the factory floor. We take that for granted in software where you're constantly iterating and agile and all this, but it seems so much harder in the physical world. I wonder actually, Eric, if you get to, you work with customers, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's your role. And would, could you give an example of how one of your customers is actually using this to iterate faster? I mean, one example that comes to mind is a, uh, a medical device manufacturer where they're, they're building abutments. So every single device that they build is going to be custom in specific response to a particular customer. So What's each, an abutment? A dental abutment. It's going to fill a negative space and in, in, uh, oh, okay. place a tooth, essentially. Got it. Yeah, so every single one of these uh, has to be manufactured custom. Um, you know, they use Tulip to uh, provide work instructions for each step along the way that are specific to that particular patient, that particular uh, step, that particular component. So uh, that's one way that they use that they use Tulip in the medical device space. So what's the actual process for them? What does that look like? So it's, it's on a, a line where you're going to be um, basically taking the finished product. You're going to be preparing it to ship to the, to the customer. You're taking the, the milled piece of titanium. You're putting a, a number of screws with it. You're preparing it. You're doing a final quality inspection. Um, and again, the, the, the possible combinations of, of ways this process could be performed is, uh, you know, they're measured in the, the hundreds of millions. So it's virtually every single one is custom. Another example that comes to mind, our very first customer was New Balance. And before, before we started working on that, I had no idea how shoes are made. Like <laughs> shoes grew on trees as far as I was concerned, <laughs> right? Um, but what's interesting about the, the problems that a shoe manufacturer has is that it's like a high volume industry, but it's also extremely high mix because you mm -hmm. have, 
you know, style, color, gender, vendor, you know, a huge amount of different products that you're making. And then when you have some kind of problem, figuring out what is the cause of that problem is really challenging. Is the sole not sticking to the top part of the shoe because the glue wasn't uh, set to dry long enough or was it not heated? I mean, shoes are baked, just so you know. <laughs> shoes are baked, I had no idea until it's dry, right? So it was it in the oven for long enough? Did it reach the right temperature? Were the two parts attached? But the, the bigger thing is that if you have an issue, figuring out why is this problem happening is mm-hmm. hard. So when you're constantly putting out new products, like that ramp up time of getting to a good process for it is, you know, it takes time. It takes mm-hmm. a lot of iterations. And so having that kind of the right, the right data at the right moment um, and giving the right feedback to the people on the floor becomes like critical to be able to get out stuff fast. We hear so much about Industry 4.0 and, you know, IoT, Internet of Things, uh, you know, industrial automation and all these. And it makes you it makes it sound like it's here at bigger companies. The smaller companies kind of are bewildered. Like, how would I ever implement that? Uh, Is it already really widely deployed? What are the hurdles in deploying the kind of technologies that you're working on? Like you said, I think a lot of the smaller manufacturings have a little bit of a what do I do first? There's part of it is like, you know, knowing enough about the art of the possible to know what would be my first step, what would be my second step to sort of start to get the benefits out of this tech. That's on that that sort of smaller manufacturing that I've seen. On the, on the bigger side of companies is that bigger companies will have an innovation arm that will be charged with doing something like that. But there are sometimes justified like hoops that you need to jump through because you have to get the consensus of, everybody from the operations side, from the IT side, from the security side, and everybody has to be aligned in order to to go forward. So have you been working with smaller businesses too? For the most part, we've actually been working with uh, with larger companies. We've started mm-hmm. to work with some smaller companies. We're, we're trying to innovate in a bunch of different ways. Like we're making a new kind of software product for an engineer that doesn't exist before. We are using a, you know, it's a cloud-based system, which is like still new and scary. The way that things are done today is that it's an incredibly long and very expensive process to deploy any kind of software Mm. on the manufacturing floor. And so we wanted to upend that entirely and say like, no, 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 no. this is not going to be like millions of dollars to get a, a proof of concept out the door. It's something that you could you know, swipe a credit card and then have a, a box that shows up at your door and then you can build your first thing in an afternoon and like put it to the floor. That so, would be amazing. You know, this notion of what we, what we call a factory kit, it's like the, the tulip in a box with like a couple of sensors, a gateway, a, you know, pick to light solution. That makes it easy both for the like the giant incumbents of manufacturing to get started, but it also enables a lot of the smaller companies that are out there that have smaller facilities and that that don't know where to start to be able to to dive into that. Can we see a demo of this? Because I've been skeptical. I see that on the web, like, oh, a little kid. How's that actually supposed to be (laughs) transforming the factory floor? Yeah. So yeah, let's, let's go off and let's do it. I'll show you. All right. So what are we looking at here? The station here is the fact that it's kind of like a pretty prototypical station for some kind of manual assembly task. In this case, the sort of the demonstration is for the final assembly of a, a sort of a consumer compressor. And um, at the workstation, we have, you know, a bunch of different tools that have been, you know, they're data collecting in different ways. So we have like a, a torque driver that you can set the torque settings for it. So you make sure that the screw is, you know, tied down, not too much, not too little, not cross-threaded, etc. Um, there's a user interface, which the, um, which the operator is using. This is where you know, an engineer building an application for this user interface. Uh, that interface is then tied to the tools through a, a gateway, this IoT gateway, an Internet of Things gateway that basically connects all that raw data from different sensors to the cloud. So what, what might some of these sensors look like? You know, on the output side, you have like a pick to light system. So something that would be uh, illuminating the right bin at the right right moment or ambient uh, temperature and humidity sensors or cameras to capture QA images or a torque driver or a caliper. So it's kind of a little bit of the, the sky's the limit in terms of the types of different sensors. It's all about having 
a Lego set that you can pick the right parts for whatever it is the problem is that you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So what, show us how this works. What the operator is going to be doing is first they take this barcode scanner, they scan in what the part it is that they're, they're making. Um, they do some kind of manual assembly process, so in this case, ensuring that the fan is properly put on, and then that goes underneath the camera to, to check that. So if the operator has put in the fan incorrectly, then we get a signal from this camera that then takes the operator to a set of steps of the corrective measure. So you can see the fan on the screen, and now it's telling us that it needs to be flipped over. Exactly. That basically means that you've error-proofed this process so that a defective product would never continue on down the line. And then additionally, like all that, the data, all the sensor data that's coming in here, the torque settings, the timing for everything, the sensor data, all that is being stored on, on a back end so that if you're trying to triage some kind of problem, like why is this glue not working? You know, is there a relationship to what the humidity was at the time when that part was put together? Now, how do you actually set this up though? Because it seems beautiful, but it, like, how do you get from not having this to having this? Right. So the whole idea for what we're trying to do is to make this super, super easy for a manufacturing engineer to do. So to build these kind of applications, you, you know, he's writing any like code to, to make it happen. It's all built using this PowerPoint style uh, application. Can you show me? Yeah, sure. So let's say, uh, let's go over here. We'll go into our, uh, our process. You know, click over, over here. And now, um, let's say we got uh, a temperature sensor that's attached to the step. If I change this rule, then I can say that when the temperature exceeds, whatever, it's a hot day today, so when it exceeds 85 degrees, then I'm going to set a flag. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna turn on an and on light, so I'm gonna say that something is, something is up here. I can send an SMS to a uh, quality manager. Uh, and in afternoon, you can go from nothing to having a fully deployed app on the shop floor where you know, it's on a touch screen, someone can start interacting with that and collecting data immediately. That's pretty amazing. So how do you look at that data then? How do you know what's going on on the shop floor? So I might say like, okay, what, what is the correlation between a particular defect category that's being reported by the operators and some environmental data that might, might come in? This kind of data, you know, people are gathering this on paper and then like they take the paper and they transcribe it into Excel and then someone has to make a graph and they print it out and they put it on the board. You know, one of our advisors calls this the, uh, the you suck yesterday board, right? <laughs> so, you know, this is kind of like the, the you suck now board, right? So you know exactly what's, what's going on. How do you think that this is going to impact jobs? That's a really good question. Uh, it's definitely in the, in the zeitgeist today about what's happening to American manufacturing and how do we bring jobs back that have gone away. And I think that the impact that we are seeing really is about enabling factory workers to do jobs more efficiently and at a higher level of quality and, and skill level than they could without the technology that we're providing is an enabler. Because we can improve the quality, we can improve the efficiency, that brings the cost of manufacturing down, which means that we can become more competitive in the global manufacturing sector that can help build up the manufacturing world here in, in the U.S., you know, with a system like Tulip, you can start to do lower run, lower sized manufacturing runs also efficiently, which mm. means that you have more opportunity for mass customization for smaller manufacturers to be able to be competitive and find a kind of niche cost effectively that they might not have been able to before. We're not seeing the net number of jobs or, or the, the need to hire more good, uh, capable uh, work associates on the shop floor go down at all. I mean, what you're seeing with the trend in automation is that you know, these, these things that are easy, they can be automated, a robot can do the job. You know, that's already happened or it's happening. And as a result, you're seeing the workers that are there being forced into more complex, more challenging operations. And yet the tools that serve them are fundamentally unchanged. How do you feel like the tools are changing generally, not just Tulip, but uh, how are tools for designing, manufacturing, et cetera, helping maybe empower the folks on the factory floor? Are you seeing a shift? Is that a trend? 
I think from the perspective of the manufacturing engineer, uh, you're seeing a group of people who are, they're comfortable with tech. They all have an iPhone in their pocket. They're comfortable using web native tools. If I put myself in the shoes of this, you know, the process engineer that graduated a couple of years ago, he or she went from this environment where they have everything's online, everything's web native, everything is uh, inter internet friendly. And then they sort of walk into this dark room, close the lights off, they put their phone in the pocket, and now they're forced into this like 1960s sort of bizarro land where you're using paper and pen and physical stopwatches and bells to track things. I mean, I think that's a very disorienting experience for most of these young manufacturing engineers. You know, you give them a tool like Tulip and they feel right at home. They say, I mean, it looks, it feels like Google Slides. Yeah, it definitely feels like our whole world has shifted more to this ability to tinker and change things on a whim, whether it's Google Slides, you're collaborating on things, the website can change. It's not like a printed program, but it's something yeah. that can change. And then that's not the case on the factory floor. So we went through our own process of manufacturing this. And like, in a sense, we are a small manufacturer that needed to turn this into something that we can produce en masse. And so we live our own problems. Of course, we dog food everything. So mm -hmm. our whole process for building our gateway is done using Tulip. And we, you know, force that on our manufacturer that they're, this is the way that we want to track our metrics. And like what resulted from that is some things that were like, you know, simple to think about in, in hindsight, but I mostly write software. And my, my cycle of if iteration is like I push compile and I run it and I see if it works. And then I do this like hundreds of times a day. You can't do that when you're making a physical thing because you, the process takes long and then you end up with a piece of scrap that actually costs you real hard money um, that you don't want to do. So the, the getting it right in fewer iterations really, really, really matters. Now, as a small startup early on, how were you in a position to ask your suppliers to implement Tulip? Well, I think the, the, the short answer is it's helpful. Mm -hmm. So it's not a huge ask, right? It's like, hey, you know, this is uh, this tool that we're going to give you for free and it's going to make your life better. So that's a pretty easy ask. And I think that there's, there's a broad spectrum of the kinds of manufacturers that are out there from the contract manufacturing side. There are manufacturing, contract manufacturers that are effectively like renting you space and you know, the people to do assembly and then you, you bring everything, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? There are other ones that are much more on that kind of like the turnkey, you know, send us uh, some blueprints and we'll, we'll make it in a black box. So by virtue of the kind of company we are, we wanted to be deeply involved in our own manufacturing process and that helped select who we, who we would pick. Presumably you're making the labor much more efficient and that's less of a factor and hopefully you could bring back manufacturing to the U.S., et cetera. Why are you manufacturing in China? Yeah, so this is a great question. Well, one of the factors is that we have a, a close relationship with our, with our manufacturer that came out of friends of ours that have made products with them and like have worked with them. And there was that personal relationship was very, very important. I think it's still very true in general in manufacturing is that that personal relationship is part of it. Uh, the second one is that it's definitely true that the cost of labor is still significantly cheaper in Asia. And that was uh, definitely a driving factor for us. You're listening to The Art of Manufacturing. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. We'll be right back after this break. The Art of Manufacturing podcast is a collaboration with Make It in LA, which is generously supported by organizations like the LA Cleantech Incubator. LACI has a really cool facility in the Arts District of downtown LA filled with energetic startups and nonprofits. They offer Cleantech startups flexible office space, epic prototyping labs, and the number one rated Cleantech incubation program in the world. Learn more at makeitinla.org slash LACI. We're speaking with Ronnie Kubat and Eric Marindet from Tulip Interfaces. What's the hardest part about selling to a customer and, and trying to get adoption of your technology? The most challenging aspect of selling to manufacturers is that there's always a fire that needs to be fought. Um, you know, these are, these are systems that all of our customers know that they need. Very seldom do we get pushback on that. When people see it, they get it. 
Uh, but the biggest roadblock we have in implementation is, you know, I just don't have time to do it today. Can we talk tomorrow? It's difficult sometimes to justify ROI on something that's uh, on a certain level somewhat meta, somewhat intangible. I mean, a common practice in manufacturing is, is lean manufacturing, right? It's know your KPIs, your key performance indicators, and monitor them continuously. When you find inefficiency or, or waste, as they call it, you know, you want to eliminate this waste. And if you subscribe to these principles, uh, you're going to have an efficient process. But if you if you were to say, okay, well, I'm going to charge you, you know, ten dollars to implement lean, they would say, what's the ROI associated with a ten dollar expense? It's very difficult to trace. Uh, concrete ROI to something that is fundamentally sort of cultural in nature. And so when we talk about implementing Tulip, it, the people who get lean get Tulip. Uh, and lean, and we, we think of Tulip in many ways almost as sort of the digital extension of this movement, if you will. You know, we, we care about all the same things. We just make the cycle time much shorter, get that feedback quicker, make it easier to continuously improve the process. Uh, How are the companies doing it now, doing lean, if they don't have that feedback loop? Well, so it exists on pen and paper. And I think this leads me to sort of the second point. It, it's, that's the competition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, these are things that if you're going to be successful with Tulip, it's because you understand process and you understand how to continuously improve your process. Tulip is a great tool to enable you to do that. But in and of itself, uh, it doesn't have intrinsic value. It's a, it's a set of tools. And so the tools today take the form of, of, of pen and paper. I, you can't put a number on it. It's like, I had no data before. Now I'm swimming in data what's that worth, hmm. right? A lot of the entrepreneurs that we talked to on this podcast, they have come to the realization how hard the human side of things are. We often come to it thinking, oh, the technology is the hardest or the manufacturing piece of it is the hardest, but it's really a human thing. In fact, Rod Brooks, who introduced us and he was on the podcast before, he struggles a lot in trying to get his robots adopted on the factory floor. And I'm curious, like you don't seem like you have the same types of problems. Is it because the hurdles are a lot less? What? Why are you not having as much challenge in adoption? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't want to overstate, you know, the, uh, I don't want to over, I guess, oversimplify how easy it is to get Tulip um, in production and as a part of your operational tempo and, and rhythm. Like that's, that's a very real challenge. The challenge is largely cultural. The market has sort of gotten the, the, the memo that, that there's, that things are changing. Uh, we're, I think where the disconnect is, is I, what does that actually mean? You know, what does it mean for me specifically? If I'm a small to medium sized business, what, like, how do I uh, you know, adopt industry 4.0? Does it mean cobots? You know, what if you can't have, afford uh, some of these things? So I think, I, I think too brings it, makes it more accessible to the folks who have the problem and know the solution. They're just lacking the tools. There's two things that I love about the manufacturing industry and the people we deal with. One is that, on the whole, manufacturing people are zero bullshit, right? They'll just say it. It's how, very true. Say it how, how it is. <laughs> that right? is true. true. You better, and it's not like you can you can talk all you talk, blah, 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 and, but they need to see it. They need to, yeah. like, do it themselves, and then that's where the belief comes from, and I, I love that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that I'm constantly confronted by people who take deep pride in what they're doing. From the perspective of adoption, when you have an operator that suddenly has a kind of, has really a tool that makes their quality higher, that gives them greater visibility to the impact of what mm -hmm. they're doing, that provides them with ways that they can contribute to the improvement of that process easily, that's like, it's a great thing for them. That makes it easier to adopt this kind of platform. Right. And I would say that the biggest mistake that I've seen of people rolling out, uh, you know, any industry 4.0 uh, uh, project, whether Tulip or, or otherwise, is that they look at the tool as the solution. They say, hey, industry 4.0 means cobots. It means digital. It means apps. It means, I, you know, IoT. And they, they sort of lose sight of the uh, the reality. And the reality is that these are just tools that help you improve a process that already exists. And if you don't have a good handle on what that process is, and if you don't know what the problems are, then no tool is going to help you be more efficient. So I, I think that's the the biggest mistake that I see made time and time again. And I, 
you know, on a, on a personal level, I think it's probably one of the biggest challenges that, that Tulip faces. People say, hey, I saw the video, you know, I, I read the, the, the use case and, and this is great. This is exactly what we need. We need that digital stuff with a sprinkle of IoT and, we, and then we're transformed and the problem is solved. And, and they, what they don't understand sometimes is that that's just the starting place. If we don't really understand, you know, why are we losing time? Like, why mm. is your quality a little bit lower than you would expect? Why is your downtime greater than you're comfortable with? If we don't understand, like, what's going on there. Um, do you have a specific example of when that happened? Yeah, I do, actually. So it was one of our customers. This is really early on. Um, and they, they came to us. They saw us at a trade show uh, out in, uh, in Germany. And they, we had, you know, all sorts of, you know, the interfaces that you saw with the, uh, with videos and interactive work instructions, very fancy. And they said, this is what we need. We need the, uh, the videos. We need the work instructions. If we had that, all of our problems would be solved. And, you know, we talked with them for a while. You know, it was clear that they wanted to do something, but it was not in any way, shape or form clear what the solution would actually entail. You could use our tools in a number of different ways. So I went out there and we met with everybody. We kind of got everybody in a room. We said, you know, what, what's the biggest problem? They said, well, our suppliers are really inconsistent. I said, well, when's the first point that you detect that? If there's a problem with the batch, where does that problem first manifest? And they say, well, we usually catch it at the end of a batch. Batch size at this particular customer could be one, if you're lucky. It could also mm. be up to 5,000. So if you're throwing away 5,000 of these, of these particular objects, they, made a, they make solenoid, uh, high-pressure, high-temperature solenoid valves, the kind of stuff you find in uh, espresso machines, actually. Mm. You know, if, if you're going through a whole batch before you realize this is a problem, and then you call the manufacturer, or excuse me, the supplier, and you're having an argument, like you've already lost, right? What you need to know in the app that they ultimately ended up building and deploying would notify them during the first part of the batch and your acceptance is lower than a set threshold, they would get a notification, they would stop the run. And then they say, hey, here's the specific data. Here's our sample size. Here's what your failure rate was. And they're not having an argument with the supplier anymore. They're having a conversation about the defective batch they were shipped. And they didn't lose any additional labor. So that's one example of sort of getting the tools before the, uh, awesome. you know, the problem. Jumping into the land of digital, you have to really deeply engage the people on the floor. You know, it's as cliche as it is, but really the people on the floor are the greatest resource that you have because they're seeing everything day to day. And like, you know, as Eric mentioned, it's as much a cultural transformation as it is a mechanical one. So we are first for a very first deployment and I see it goes down. So like, luckily New Balance is like a couple of miles away. So hop in the car, drive over there. And like, see what? something for ma local manufacturing. Yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> and and why is it down? It's like not because like a bug in our system or like a server crashed or anything like that. It's down because somebody unplugged it. Why did they <laughs> unplug it? Because they wanted to plug in their phone and charge it. Oh my God. <laughs> right? So why did they do that? Because the people on the floor did not really understand what the value of this thing is and why, why is it important that they, they do this? What benefit do they get out of getting all of this, this data? When you actually sit down, have a conversation, understand like what is the problems that they're facing? Like why do they need to charge the phone? Because there's no power plugs there for them to plug it in. And they want to, you know, they go on for their lunch break. and want to see pictures of their grandkids. It's amazing what you could do with a conversation and a power strip. <laughs> so if you were to boil it down to your top few steps to implement quote unquote industry 4.0 and kind of the digital manufacturing, what would those key points be? Step one, uh, know your process and know what specifically needs to be improved in your process. Uh, step two, understand what tools exist out there to help solve that problem. Three, pick the appropriate tool and figure out how do you get it live. And four is, uh, don't think you're done just because you deployed that tool. You haven't transformed. What you've done is you've equipped yourself uh, a little bit more effectively and, and the journey's just begun. You know, it's a little bit of a, a wild west right now because it is all the buzzwords uh, all the time. And I think that if you are looking to deploy something for real, you should take a, a longer view of what is the ecosystem in which that solution is going to be how are these systems going to start to talk to each other? We've gone into factories 
that have already started on their process of some kind of digital something or other, whether it be like the first uh, CNC machine that goes into grows into something else. What ends up happening is you end up in these world of silos where one box does not know how to talk to another box, and now you have a new problem. So, Eric, you've had an interesting past, <laughs> and uh, you've been in counterintelligence. You've gone across Africa on a dirt bike. H- how do you? How does that influence the way you look at what you're doing now? And and how do you? How can you stand still? Actually, yeah. doing what you're doing now. I think it was the the natural extension. It was you know dirt biking across Africa, counterintelligence, manufacturing IT was the next thing. <laughs> of course. Yeah, that was uh, that was you know uh, building early stage companies is it's a stressful, fun, challenging, engaging thing. You know, it's uncertain and it's beautiful. Uh, and doing it with a team that's small, that's sort of making up the rules as you go, figuring out the best way to do it, and constantly iterating. Um, you know, there's nothing better. Tell me about that time that you went across Africa, what was the most memorable moment that you can't forget? <laughs> yeah, it was, um, I mean, it was a little bit insane. So I'm uh, a few years removed, about 15 years removed almost from it now. Yeah, we picked up a, a dirt bike down in South Africa and rode it to Egypt. I think 13 countries, like two civil wars, uh, and I don't know how many people groups, um, you know, big animals and, and rebels and you name it, right? I, I, one of the most memorable experiences for me, though, was on top of a volcano called Niragunga down in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. It's just outside of a, a town called Goma. It's one of the most active volcanoes in the world. We paid a couple of um, actually rebel troops uh, to, to go up with us. And so we climbed up this volcano with no, no trail or anything like that. And you, you know, it took the better part of a day to get up there uh, and most of the night to get back down. But, you know, while we were on top, sort of looking over the edge, you know, into this big cauldron of lava sort of churning, and then we got hit by a thunderstorm up there. So the rain, like the thunder was both kind of above and but also below. Uh, surreal moment. And you wrote a book about it. Was it hard to write a book? And do you, are you happy you did it? I think writing a book is, is something I'm very, very proud of. Glad I did it. You know, it was a pretty uh, an eventful. I don't want to, uh, you know, give away too much, right? But it was a pretty eventful trip. So it was also a very cathartic process for me. I highly recommend it if there's something on, on your mind, a story that you've got to get out. I mean, there's no better way to do it. How long did it take? You know, I did not I did nothing else for about a year. That's yeah. crazy. I, I bought a one-way ticket to Hawaii, picked up a job tending bar, and uh, lived on the beach for about a month, and then ended up renting a closet. <laughs> and uh, that's what I did for the better part of that year. And then I went back, and uh, it was time to do other things. So I went back into the military, and, and so goes the rest of the story. So... What did you do in the military? You were doing intelligence work? Yeah, so I, I, I uh, ran intelligence operations, human intelligence and offensive counterintelligence operations. <laughs> you know, it's not unlike uh, working at a startup. In all seriousness, I, so you have a small team, you have uh, big problems, the stakes are high, you know, you're committed to the, uh, to the outcome and you're operating in a very uncertain environment, usually against targets that are better equipped, um, better resourced, and you figure out a way to win, you know, every day of the week, because that's your job, because that's what you got to do. Ronnie, how did you end up starting a business? Did you ever think that you're going to be an entrepreneur? What kind of skills did you bring to this? My formal training is all in that in that engineering domain. But from a perspective of being an entrepreneur and, and wanting to start something, I think that that grew for a long time, you know, from, from very early, early days of like being the first, I think, CD-ROM yearbook, you know, back when I was in high school. Uh, and you were my, at MIT. I was right? at MIT, which has a very strong entrepreneurial spirit to it. My office mate started a company and became the first employee there for a, a little while. And so it was just around you. I mean, you just, just felt like, like... constantly around me. And so for me, like, I want to build something. I want to be in charge of my own destiny. I want to make sure that what I do is really creating some kind of like real value. How did you end up in reality TV? <laughs> uh, when I was in undergrad, there was a show that you'd hear about, Junkyard Wars. This was like a reality TV show for for engineers. It's like mm-hmm. the coolest thing ever. And friend and I, you know, found out that they were kind of soliciting 
new teams. And so three of us got together and, and applied and, and got on. And what was that like? What did, what, what do you actually do when you're on a reality show? A lot of hard work. <laughs> like, did they pay you? No, no. You, really? you, you pay. You don't even get no, SAG wages. No, no, no. This is like, you do it for pride. Like you want, <laughs> <laughs> you would totally do it for pride. There's yeah. no like prize other than like a piece of junk that they turn into a, <laughs> a you know, a trophy. There like, you go. Hollywood explaining people yeah, again. It's like in this particular show, they, they limited you to 10 hours of work time of stuff that you'd find in a very art directed junkyard. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, was it like the 270 competition that we took it's, at MIT? It's like, like 270 except for you got to cut corners. <laughs> like, <laughs> you only have 10 hours. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and you're making something pretty big. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was 10 hours of straight adrenaline. What did you learn through that process? Things I learned mostly were about safety <laughs> <laughs> and things to not do again in the future. Cause it was at too high, you know, potential cost of life and limb. The first competition that we were in was a uh, a land yacht competition. We'd build a effectively a, a sail car for the r- riding in the desert. Our particular take on that was not to use a cloth sail, but to use a sheet metal sail that we cut out of a a truck. Um, but that basically meant that we had a guillotine over our heads, and that like the the risk for us was that if you know one of the guy wires were to fail during you're know, going at thirty miles an hour and hits a rock or something, this thing is going to slice your head off. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, you know, stuff that in hindsight I would certainly not do again. And but at least it got paid really well. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> do you regret having done it? Would you Absolutely do it again? Absolutely not. No, no, no it, was, awesome. it was a blast. But you would do it again. <laughs> it was, oh, I'd totally do it again. Yeah? It was a lot of fun. It was a, it was a super ton of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Tell me about your 16-year-old self. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, um, 16-year-old self had uh, hair be below my shoulders. Oh man, what what grade is sixteen? Sixteen is like tenth like grade. Yeah, tenth grade. Just got your license. Sixteen. Where do you live? I live in the outskirts of Boston, and and that that high school I went to was a incredible wealth of freedom. This place was very special because where, where was it? Uh, Lincoln Sudbury uh, oh, okay. High School, and the thing that was was nice about it is that there was a, an incredible trust placed in the student body, so that you would have, you know, regular times during the during the day or week where you'd have free time, and nobody cared if you were in the halls playing guitar as long as you weren't interrupting, you know, a class that was going on, and so. You know, I spent, I don't know how many countless hours between the hours of 1 a.m. and like 5 a.m. shooting a stupid, you know, high school movie in the steam tunnels underneath my building that like all the administrators knew we were doing. They're like, don't breathe the asbestos. It's like that, <laughs> that was like, it that was their like, advice to us. Sounds like MIT, but in high school. Yeah, it's <laughs> a lot like of that. flexibility. It was a very Amazing. special place. <laughs> Tell me about your 16-year-old self, Eric. It was a very different 16-year-old self. I, I was uh, somewhat of a delinquent. Uh, I had recently found sports, you know, driving around. I grew up in Michigan, um, in Grand Rapids. Had girlfriends and friends and not a thought to any possible future beyond the age of 18. Um, <laughs> so it was When a people think different. of Grand Rapids, I think they think about manufacturing more yeah. than they would you know, here in Boston, right? Uh, How do you think that these kinds of innovations are going to change where you came from? I mean, that's the industry that my family comes from. I still have a lot of family back in in Michigan, and this is what they do. They they build things. My grandfather, you know, and my uncles, you know, and I look at what's happened sort of in the Midwest and and how technology is impacting them. You know, this is a company that I'm very excited to bring home. So, Ronnie, What's the one piece of advice you wished someone else had told you before you get started that you wanted to share with our listeners? Um, Making sure that you are always working on the most important thing, whatever that is. And it's very tempting to work on the thing that you want to work on. That's the fun thing. The reality is, is that there's a lot of boring things that you need to do, but they're the most important things. Awesome. How, how do people learn more? Check us out. www.tulip.co. Dot, dot co. Dot co. Social media? What would that be? 
I have no idea. I'm yes. serious. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. You're not wasting your time. No, it's it. like, so we have uh, we have Facebook, we have LinkedIn, we have all Twitter, right. we have a marketing guy. We'll find um, it. Who yeah. handles we'll, all that stuff? Anyway, it's awesome. Uh, th- really, what you're what you're doing is very impressive. It's beautiful. You know, it's it's um, something that I think people can relate to, and it's neat to see the the development of this in an accessible way. So thanks so much for letting us look under the hood and give us some yeah. tips. Thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. The first thing that struck me is how hard it's been to implement lean manufacturing. It's kind of crazy because it's based on the principles advanced by Toyota almost 100 years ago. The basic idea is reducing waste while not sacrificing productivity. You might have heard terms like Kaizen or the five whys or Kanban, just in time and others. And there's no shortage of things to learn. But what I learned today is the most important thing is to develop the process first and the tools just make it easier to implement and evolve. Another thing that struck me is how Tulip's tools let businesses experiment and tinker more. We met a lot of guests on this show that talk about iteration, but it's a lot harder to iterate in the physical world. Tools that give immediate feedback allow you to adjust and evolve faster, almost like you can in software. And finally, I believe good tools not only can make manufacturing more productive, it might help make manufacturing sexy again. Tulip is bringing to the factory the kind of interfaces and tools that today's generation takes for granted. One of the biggest challenges of the manufacturing industry today is a whole generation of baby boomer manufacturing engineers is retiring, leaving as many as 2 million jobs open in the United States in the coming years, with very few people that want to take their place. But if we can make the factory floor as easy to design as it is to build a website, maybe we can reverse that trend. But at the same time, as you engage the new generation, you have to make it easy for the older generation to adopt the technology, which is no small feat. Fortunately, the tools were surprisingly intuitive. What I think is especially cool is that contrary to stereotypes, new tools don't always leave people behind. Tulip is making technology more accessible. I'm a huge fan of design tools that let people tap into their creative potential without a lot of technical expertise. Do you have experience with a tool that makes building a new product more accessible? Please share. We want to hear about it. Connect with us on social at Art of MFG or send me an email at team at artofmfg.com. Time to wrap it up for the Art of Manufacturing. Tune in next Thursday when we meet Preeti Bhattacharya, the founder of Hydroswarm. When she was growing up in India, she never dreamed she'd be launching an ambitious startup building autonomous underwater robots. For show notes, visit www.artofmfg.com. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. Never miss an episode. Subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or your favorite player. And if you like the show, do us a favor and leave us a review. Or send us a message with your thoughts and ideas to feedback at artofmfg.com. This podcast is produced by At Large and Dangerous in collaboration with Make It in LA and other partners. Visit makeitinla.org slash connect to sign up for local LA events and news. A big shout out to Peter Brandenburg, the producer and audio engineer. Thanks for listening to The Art of Manufacturing. I'm Z Holly, and remember, don't just make it, make it.